Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 14th Annual Federalist Society Faculty Division Conference. Uh, delighted that you were able to join us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Lee Liverman Otis. I am the director of the Faculty Division um, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, delighted to have everybody here today. Um, Without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Dean Weiner and he'll get us started. Thanks very much, Lee. I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this uh, panel of exciting scholars. Uh, we had uh, lunch today uh, that lasted about an hour and a half and if the hour and a half at, at lunch was anything like uh, the next hour and a half will be, I, I think you'll be glad you came. Uh, it's a fascinating group. First up is going to be David Zaring who received his BA from Swarthmore, his JD from Harvard. Uh, David was a law clerk in the Federal District Court in California, and then with uh, Judge uh, Judith Rogers at the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. He served as a trial attorney for the uh, Justice Department with a stint as a special assistant to the general counsel at uh, HUD. Although he is currently on the faculty at the Wharton School, he has served as an assistant professor at Washington and Lee Law School, uh, and as a visitor or VAP at Penn, Vanderbilt, and NYU. Uh, David has written extensively on financial regulation, administrative law, and international law. Uh, he is a runner and a father uh, to two children who are both under age two. So we're especially <laughs> pleased that he could be here tonight. Uh, next up to bat will be Lynn Stout, received her BA and MPA from Princeton and a JD from Yale. Uh, she's currently the Paul Hastings Distinguished Professor at UCLA. She's also taught at Harvard, NYU, Georgetown, and GW. She is the author of numerous books and articles on business law, finance, and behavior. Uh, most notably for present purposes, she wrote a 1995 article whose title tells a, a huge story and compliment to her. The title of her 1995 article was Betting the Bank, How Derivatives Trading Reduces Returns and Increases Risks on Financial Markets. Uh, Professor Stout has testified before the United States Senate on the need to move uh, speculative trading and financial derivatives onto private exchanges and clearinghouses. She serves as an independent trustee and chair of the Governance Committee for the Eden Vance family of mutual funds. She has lectured to derivatives traders. She's a guest contributor to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. Uh, and on January 1, she climbed Mount Wilson, the long route, in one day. And uh, uh, last uh, making uh, initial remarks would be J.W. Verrett, received his BS from LSU and his JD and MA from Harvard. He was a clerk with the Delaware Chancery Court, uh, has been an associate at Skadden Arps. Uh, he's currently on the faculty at George Mason Law School. He's a productive young scholar on financial matters who has testified nine times for the United States House of Representatives or the United States Senate, uh, all on uh, financial regulatory reform. Uh, he has appeared on many media and is a frequent blogger. Uh, he is a full-blooded Cajun who cooks a mean dark roux gumbo. Uh, now, as to our process, uh, each will make a 13-minute presentation. Uh, then for 15 minutes, the panelists will exchange remarks uh, among themselves or respond to moderator questions if necessary. And if lunch is any indication, uh, moderator questions will not be necessary. And then we'll uh, save the uh, uh, good half hour at the end for uh, uh, questions uh, from the floor. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to David Zarin. So uh, this panel is on, uh, among other things, uh, the, the uh, taking of government stakes in private companies, um, uh, which is a subject which both 
I and Jay Barrett have uh, been uh, have written on, um, uh, and from different perspectives. Um, and my perspective is that uh, in um, uh, is more sanguine about uh, in the wake of the financial crisis the way the government has taken ownership and managed its ownership state in a number of uh, particularly financial but some non-financial companies. And I want to explain why I've been sanguine and give a little tour of the horizon of um, what sorts of things the government have done. And one of the things I, I won't talk about too much is the way the government has uh, uh, done corporate governance of um, the companies in which it's taken a stake. Uh, that's something uh, which some people have been worried about, including uh, uh, Jay Barrett and uh, Marce Marcel Kahan and Ed Rock also have a paper on that. But in many cases, uh, the government has uh, declined to vote its shares um, and uh, exercise some of the tools of corporate governance which one might expect from a government shareholder. So, um, so I won't have so much to say about that, but there's certainly uh, much that could be said, um, and I, I will point you to others uh, if you'd like to hear more about it. What I'd like to talk about is um, some of the ways the government has um, uh, has intervened in um, the running of private companies in the wake of the financial crisis. And one of the things it's done is it's managed the compensation of executives. Uh, but its executive compensation program uh, was uh, limited to seven companies um, that required particularly large bailouts in the wake of the crisis. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that to the extent that the government has intervened in that uh, private contract, that private contractual matter between a corporation and its employees as to how much those employees will be paid, I think it's done so more as a model than as a rule. It's not that every bank in the country now has to compensate its executives in a particular way mandated by the government, or that the government reviews every employment contract that uh, financial intermediaries uh, offer their star traders or their executives. Uh, instead, the government um, uh, hired a special uh, master, um, Kenneth Feinberg, to uh, engage in a sort of negotiated process of compensation for those seven companies that required very large bailouts. Uh, that, to me, uh, um, uh, isn't a really um, serious uh, 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 depredation of sort of the ability to engage in private employment contracting. Um, and of course, it uh, might be the case that you want executives of companies to pay a price uh, when they are taken over by uh, either a, a private company or by the government. Uh, sometimes those executives, I'd say in many, many cases, are replaced, and when they're not replaced, Often their compensation is adjusted by the new managers. And so the question you have to ask yourself, and this is a question I ask myself again and again with government interventions in private markets, is, um, is whether uh, what the government's doing is really so different than what um, a private equity fund might do uh, if it took over a company. Another thing that the government has done in the wake of the financial crisis is it hasn't gotten out of uh, the business of owning businesses uh, as quickly as it might have. Um, uh, it's retained its stake in, among other companies, AIG, um, and it didn't sell its stake in uh, some uh, number of banks uh, 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 where it took equity stakes, um, TARP bailout banks, as soon as it possibly could. So maybe that worries you if you're worried about um, uh, public, um, uh, public uh, uh, takeovers of private businesses. Uh, maybe you worry that the government will never get out of those private businesses and will move to some sort of different kind of economic model where some companies, including financial intermediaries, uh, um, are uh, owned largely by the government. That'll look a lot like France, which is forever nationalizing and then uh, unnationalizing its banks in some constant cycle of um, of, I'm sure, logic, um, but uh, uh, often uh, hard to insist on logic. But the fact is, um, the government has started reducing its stake in, in financial companies, and uh, it reduced it in a way which, again, might make you wonder what a private equity investor would do. And in my view, a private equity investor might be inclined to hold on to a stake, even as they look for an early exit, uh, to the point where they can get the best expected return for their money. 
The government has made money, uh, uh, it uh, alleges, um, on its investments in the financial crisis. And so it's not clear to me in the end that the way it's managed its stakes, the stakes that it took, uh, is a way that should trouble us or that we would expect a private market participant to do differently. Okay, a third thing that the government has done, and this is, um, I think, uh, troubling and also quite a ubiquitous and, and long-running uh, long feature of government regulation, is sometimes it's uh, seized banks and other financial institutions um, and nationalized them briefly and either resolved them, that is, taken them through a quick bankruptcy, or forced their sale um, or uh, made them sell to some other company. Uh, now, resolution authority, um, uh, as this um, uh, power of the government is known, is a power that uh, the FDIC has held since the creation of the FDIC. Um, and it's been used thousands of times since the 1930s, um, uh, thousands of time alone in the 1980s during the savings and loan crisis. Um, and so it's not that it's a power that the government has that, um, uh, you know, has never been subject to judicial review. Um, uh, courts have always found this regulation constitutional. Um, and uh, I think um, it's logical to understand why. Uh, what courts have done is they've said, well, look, uh, if a government seizes and nationalizes an institution and sells it off for pennies on the dollar, that might look like a taking of property without due process of law. Um, sometimes the FDIC shows up uh, before going to court. Um, uh, the goal is to sell a failing bank over a weekend. Um, uh, and it certainly uh, implicates the takings clause as well. But courts have, uh, have always held that, um, that banks that uh, operate under FDIC protection uh, have made a deal with the government. And the deal is uh, we get access to cheap, cheap money by consumers who no longer worry about whether their bank will be solvent the next morning. We, uh, uh, in turn, also get the opportunity not to be subject to runs on the bank. And in exchange for that, we give up some of the rights we would have, uh, the due process and uh, takings clause um, it, rights we would have to object um, uh, if it turns out that um, our bank's insolvent and needs to be closed or sold quickly. So that's the deal. Uh, and it's fair to say that this deal may also exist for other financial institutions which don't just uh, engage in consumer deposits a deal that the Federal Reserve um, offers uh, its members um, and the uh, investment banks and other banks um, that it gave access to the discount window to. Uh, and that's something that um, all the investment banks took advantage of during the financial crisis, as did all the commercial banks. Um, and the deal is there, maybe, that uh, if you want to engage in a system where you can borrow money cheaply from the government, when things get tough, uh, you have to put up with a system where the government uh, can sell you uh, at $2 a share if um, it believes you have quickly become insolvent. That's what happened to Bear Stearns. Uh, so um, so that's, a, that's a deal which doesn't necessarily conform to all the niceties of uh, uh, the um, constitutional protections that we enjoy against um, uh, uh, rash, quick government action. Um, but that's the deal that I think explains why courts have so far been relatively happy uh, to sit back and let the government seize failing institutions when uh, it believes uh, that that's necessary for the health of the financial system uh, and for the um, uh, best possible outcomes for the uh, consumer deposits insured by the, um, that it ensures that those institutions hold. Um, now, um, as I said, I'm generally sanguine about uh, the way the government's exercised its powers in the financial system in the wake of the financial crisis. I think it's worth noting that um, it's not that every country believes, um, uh, uh, to, uh, accepts the ability uh, the government's decisions, resolution author exercises of resolution authority as blithely as do American courts. Uh, in Sweden, there's a great deal of worry that um, during the Swedish banking crisis, uh, 
of the 90s um, that uh, the Swedish government nationalized banks very quickly uh, at real cost to the shareholders of those banks. And in Germany, there's uh, a lot of legal protections that um, shareholders of banks enjoy to contest uh, government-run resolutions. And you may have read in the newspaper that Christopher Flowers, um, the American uh, uh, hedge fund investor or private equity investor, uh, has pursued his judicial remedies there and before the European Union. So I think this, this resolution authority question is, um, uh, though it can get a, a little bit dry if you uh, get into the weeds of the CAMEL-5 um, uh, factors that the FDIC looks to to ensure that a bank is solvent. Um, I think it's fair to say that you can imagine a world in which um, uh, owners of banks enjoy more protection against government seizures than the one we have. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, the system that we have is one that the courts have accepted for a number of years that the um, FDIC and then um, during the financial crisis, the FDIC and a bunch of other agencies made use of a bunch of times. Um, and that uh, if you uh, can find a sort of deal offered to private equity investors ex ante, a deal of access to the discount window in exchange for the risk of fast administrative action with little checks or access to um, uh, federally insured deposits in exchange for those fast resolutions, uh, then I think you have a, a sense of why, uh, why the courts have concluded that those kinds of um, actions have been okay. So I have now um, a couple more minutes where uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, is that what you have? I have one. Oh, I have one minute too. Okay, um, uh, where what I wanna do is talk about the, the um, uh, the Okaran issue of nationalization, uh, and, and that's the $25 billion suit by um, the former CEO and uh, uh, large stockholder of AIG against the government um, for uh, the, way it, uh, it, uh, the way it's exercised its stake in AIG um, during and after the financial crisis. So there you can see there's no FDIC or discount window deal. AIG didn't get um, insured deposits and didn't get access to cheap money from the Federal Reserve. Um, there were severe sanctions uh, imposed on AIG shareholders when AIG was taken over. Uh, and the people who got bailed out when AIG got bailed out were really AIG's creditors uh, or other financial institutions. Um, AIG had to borrow its money at 14.5% um, when Citi got access to the TARP it didn't uh, have to pay that kind of interest rate. Uh, and so, uh, so to hear governments being exercising management and picking an owner. So um, are you, uh, and, and picking a CEO of, this, of, of the company. So are you worried uh, as uh, Hank Greenberg is about AIG's ownership stock? And um, I think he's made a, a couple of arguments which are interesting but unpersuasive and a couple of arguments which are, which are worth exploring. Uh, first, I don't think it's problematic that AIG is being treated differently than other bank institutions. Um, uh, governments treat people differently all the time uh, and loaning uh, people different uh, money at different interest rates is not uh, uh, something that I think implicates the due process or takings clause. I also think it's not necessarily problematic if the government takes an ownership stake over a company and, and then lays waste to the company. Um, after all, uh, governments have owned companies all over the world for a very long time, and there's no obligation that governments treat those uh, ownership stakes um, uh, with, the po with the greatest possible diligence, or at least it doesn't seem that way to me. I do wonder uh, about the government's authority for taking over AIG, where it found it had the administrative uh, uh, capacity um, uh, to engage in the bailout that it ended up engaging in uh, and the way it took that stock. Um, but that's something that, uh, um, uh, that's something that, uh, uh, that in addition to Windstar, maybe we can talk about in the Q&A if you're interested. But to conclude, I'd say that, um, uh, that when the government's manager, it turns out, I think it, it acts a lot like other managers. It imposes sanctions on failing institutions like other managers do, and that's maybe what it did in AIG. So when the government manages uh, um, uh, private companies, I don't think it acts very differently than other managers. When the government seizes those companies, I think the question's a bit more complicated. Uh, and I've tried to explore some of those issues with you. Um, but I'm also ultimately relatively sanguine about that as well. Thanks very much. like to tell a story 
a story about one of the fundamental causes of the 2008 credit crisis that has been largely overlooked, both in the popular understanding and even in the financial press. And also, that story is a story of government intervention in markets. But it's a different, different sort of government intervention than David was just talking about, less visible and yet more fundamental. It's government intervention that takes the form of subsidizing certain kinds of economic activities. And the economic activity in particular that our government began heavily subsidizing in the 1990s leading up to the 2008 crisis was the economic activity known as gambling. So I think a lot of people in this room are going to like where I end up, but I have to warn you, to get to where I end up, I'm going to have to go through two arguments that people may not like as well, at least initially. They're sort of controversial, although I'm told that controversial arguments are nothing new at the Federalist Society. Um, and if you want me to talk about these ideas in greater detail in questions, I would be happy to, but I want to start with just getting the two controversial ideas on the table. Okay, the first idea is that most of us don't really understand what derivatives are. That may not be a coincidence because the people who are involved in the de derivatives industry like to talk about them in ways that would make it almost impossible for you to understand what they are. They talk about them as assets sometimes toxic assets, as investments, as contracts. And then they might talk about them specifically as uh, CDO squared or credit default swaps or forex contracts or something that would just make your eyes close in narcolepsy. I'm going to tell you what derivatives really are. They are bets. I don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. It's not a figure of speech. A derivative is literally a bet. Because a derivative is an agreement to, between two people that one of them will pay the other an amount of money that's determined by what happens in the future. An interest rate swap is a bet on the behavior of interest rates, just like your betting ticket at Santa Anita Racetrack is a bet on the performance of the horses in the race. There is literally no difference between these two. So derivatives, we need to understand, are bets. And there are two reasons, generally, why people use bets. One reason that's socially productive is people use bets to insure things. If you stop to think about it, homeowner's insurance or fire insurance is nothing more than a bet with an insurance company that your house is going to burn down. And if your house, in fact, burns down, you win the bet. But you've lost the house. And what this illustrates is that when bets are used to counteract pre-existing economic risks. They're actually economically beneficial because they allow you to pass on the risk to someone who can bear it more easily, in this case to the insurance company that can bear it more easily because it's diversified, it holds, it's a whole bunch of insurance policies, and therefore it's a cheaper risk bearer. However, as any racetrack gambler will tell you, in addition to using bets for insurance, you can use them for another purpose that I'm going to call gambling, meaning you're actually taking on risk, why would you do that? In the hope that your prediction will prove more accurate than your betting counterparty's prediction, you will win the bet and you will make money. It's really, in some ways, an incredibly simple idea that when you bet on things to try and profit from making a prediction that's more accurate than someone else's, you're really just gambling in the hopes of earning a profit. Now, that's controversial idea number two. Let me get, sorry, number one, let me get to controversial idea number two. Gambling is economically harmful. I'm not going to speak to the morals of it, although there's certainly many people who rely on moral arguments. I'm going to stick to sheer economics. Why is gambling harmful? Well, gambling is harmful because it is fundamentally a zero-sum game. I can only win the money that you lose. And, by the way, if there are any transactions costs involved, in fact, the zero-sum game becomes a negative-sum game. So that societies that have a high degree of gambling are actually societies in which people are wasting valuable resources in the pursuit of profits 
that on average never appear. I mean, I may win the bet, I may lose the bet, but there's no amount of money I'm gonna get that isn't coming out of, you know, if I'm betting with Don, it's coming out of his pocket. And if he and I have to take time and energy to bet, that's wasted time and energy from a social perspective. But that may be the least of the harms associated with gambling. And by the way, I'm leaving aside recreational gambling. The fact is, you know, my dad used to play the ponies, and he got a lot of joy out of it, and he did lose money, but not much. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about massive derivatives bets by hedge fund managers and mutual fund managers and banks, and they weren't doing it because they wanted to enjoy the casino. They were doing it because they expected to make money. I've got news for you. Half of them were disappointed, and both sides had to pay either at a minimum in terms of lost time and effort, may, may have even had to pay a counterparty like a Goldman Sachs that took the position in the middle. But that's not necessarily the worst social loss that comes from gambling. The second social loss that comes from gambling is that it adds risk. By definition, it adds risk. Remember, in finance, risk is variation in outcomes. When you walk into a casino, you have $100 in your pocket. That's a certainty. That's not a risk. When you start gambling, you don't know if you're going to walk out with $200 or nothing. You have just created a risk that doesn't exist. Why is risk bad? Well, if people are risk averse, risk is just intrinsically bad because we don't like variation. We're only lured into accepting it because we mistakenly think we're going to profit from our bet. Risk is also bad, at least in some people's view, because it increases inequality without producing any social benefit. Again, the winning gambler's richer, the poorer gambler is the losing gambler's poor. And finally, as we've seen very dramatically in 2008, when gambling is done by large interconnected institutions, it increases systemic risk that can have pretty dreadful third-party effects when a gambling institution goes bust and suddenly all of its counterparties have to worry that they may be insolvent too because the gamblers are not going to be able to pay off their bets. Now, just as an aside, you might ask yourself, some of you, I hope, are saying, yeah, this is actually kind of obvious. But there may be some of you saying, oh my god, she's got to be completely wrong because I've heard economists talk about derivatives trading and they tell us how wonderful and economically beneficial it is. I'm willing to develop this, but I think we need to understand that the reason why economists often talk about speculative trading and derivatives, also known among laypersons as gambling, as beneficial is because of two things. Number one, they're assuming that we live in a world in which there is mere risk and no uncertainty. If you've read The Black Swan, one of my favorite new books, you'll understand the difference. Risk is a coin toss. We know the coin may come up heads or tails, but we also know the probability of each of them is 50%. You can't disagree on the value of a coin toss. Uncertainty exists when we not only don't know, don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we don't even know what the future probabilities are. What's going to happen to the credit rating of, say, Google is uncertain. We don't know what the probability distribution is, and therefore reasonable people can disagree. And it's that disagreement that uncertainty permits that allows an optimistic bull and a bearish bear to get together and decide that each of them will enter a credit default swap on, say, Google bonds, and they each expect to profit. Um, there's another reason why you maybe haven't heard a lot in economic theory about gambling as a problem, and that is, I hate to say it, I have to blame old Uncle Milton. He wrote a very famous short chapter called In Defense of Price, Destra Price Destabilizing Speculation. And if you actually read old Uncle Milton, he was smart, and he ends up basically defining speculation as something that's not speculation at all, because he defines it as trading by people who truly have superior information and therefore routinely make profits. But we know, in fact, that that's not what's going on with a lot of speculative trading because speculators in many markets don't make profits. We know that active managed, actively managed mutual funds in the stock market don't make profits on average. Therefore, we know that what Milton described is not what they're doing because they're losing money. And I can assure you, although I don't think anyone's figured it out, my guess is that the average derivatives trader, in fact, doesn't make any money. Of course, some do. But for every derivatives trader who makes money, we've got one who doesn't. OK, now this is where we get to the really interesting part. The law has known this for 2,000 years. I have not found a single successful economy that did not have some legal restraints on gambling. That includes the Romans. 
But the nature of the restraints on gambling are very interesting and very subtle. And again, this is a pattern. We see it in the Romans, among the Romans law, and we actually see it in the United States in the middle of the 19th century. And the rule was this. If you made a bet with someone, that wasn't a crime. You were allowed to bet. Well, actually, technically, it was a crime outside of the two weeks of Saturnalia in Rome, but it was never enforced. But the part that was enforced was that betting contracts were not enforceable in the courts. And the argument was very simple. It is a government subsidy to give you access to public courts to enforce your contracts. We reserve that subsidy for bargains that have some chance of being mutually beneficial and contributing to social wealth. We will not subsidize contracts that are fundamentally zero sum and don't contribute to social welfare. And that was the law in the United States on derivatives in the 1800s. Because, by the way, there were derivatives in the United States in the 1800s. They were called difference contracts. And there's a very famous rule, or at least it was famous in the, 18, in the 1800s. If you want, don't believe me, take a look at the Supreme Court case of Irwin versus Williar. I think it's 1886 or 1868. I can't remember exactly which year. And it'll tell you that in the United States at common law, a derivative was not enforceable unless one of the parties could prove they were really insuring and that they had some economic interest at risk and the risk was offset by the derivatives contract. And you want to know what this system worked beautifully. In a way, it was the ultimate deregulation. It was government saying, we're going to stay out of your dealings to the point where we won't even give you access to public courts to enforce them. Now, not surprisingly, that didn't stop gambling. It didn't stop it gambling in Rome 2,000 years ago, and it didn't stop gambling and derivatives in the 1800s in the United States. But what it did do was require the gamblers to rely on private ordering. In Rome, this takes the form of private gambling clubs. And let me tell you, a private gambling club in Rome 2,000 years ago was a lot like a casino today. What's the first thing you have to do when you walk into a casino? You have to prove you have the money to pay off your bets. You have to buy your chips. It was the same thing with Roman gambling clubs. They were not, allow people, they were not about to allow people who didn't have any money to go in and start making bets they couldn't pay off. Well, the same thing happened in the United States in the 1800s. This is the origin of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, and all of the commodity futures exchanges. They are functionally private gambling clubs that were created to make sure that the people who were betting on the prices of pork bellies and wheat and silver could actually pay off their bets, which meant you either had to be a member of the exchange or your trade had to be guaranteed by a member that would require you to post margin, to have collateral, to have adequate capital. And you know what it did? It allowed gambling to go on without ever infecting the larger economy. There were lots of economic crises in the 19th century. None of them, so far as I can tell, were caused by derivative speculation. What went wrong? Well, what went wrong, how am I doing on time? I think I should probably hurry up a bit. Uh, you got a couple more. I got a couple more minutes, okay. What, wrong, what went wrong, in my view, is that we replaced this beautiful state-based common law system that withheld government intervention, even to the extent of refusing to enforce contracts, thereby encouraging private ordering, we replaced it with federal regulation. The first stop is the adoption of what eventually became the Commodities Exchange Act, which I think was first in its original precursor. The Futures Trading Act was passed in 1926. It became the CEA sometime in the 30s, and it gets a little bit expanded in the 50s and the 60s. But what was interesting about it was what it did was it created a federal agency to oversee the private exchanges, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, but it didn't interfere with the old common law rule that said that if you were gambling and you weren't on an exchange, you couldn't go to court to enforce your deal. It didn't do that until 1992, when at the behest of, among others, several banks in Wall Street that wanted to trade in derivatives convinced the Congress to preempt the old common law rule against difference contracts and to say that all regulation of gambling on financial phenomena had to take place at the federal level. That happened in 1992. You won't be surprised to hear 
that the notional value of the derivatives markets, which was less than 17 trillion in 1992, had reached 67 trillion by the year 2000. So this market almost tripled because among other things, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission took the position that at least some sort of off exchange derivatives gambling, in particular interest rate swaps, was going to be okay in the eyes of the feds. And of course, it was only the feds. The state could no longer regulate this. By the way, what happened when the CFTC decided in 1993 to essentially make interest rate swaps off an exchange legally enforceable for the first time in business history, as far as I can tell? Well, you get the immediate collapse of Orange County and long-term capital from what? Making bad derivatives bets that it turns out they couldn't afford to pay off. Now, a proper Burkean conservative, I would say, at this point would say, you know, maybe this business of legalizing and enforcing off-exchange derivatives gambling is not such a good idea. But that's not our Congress, of course. They decide in 2000 that, hey, this initial experiment worked out so well, let's go whole hog. And they pass a statute called the Commodities Futures Modernization Act. It was at the suggestion of Phil Graham, but it was definitely with the willing support of Bill Clinton. Equal opportunity for blame here. What the Commodities Futures Modernization Act said was, in effect, for the first time in American business history, legalized gambling on financial phenomenon is allowed in the United States. And you won't be surprised to hear that at that point, after passage of the CFMA, the size of the OTC over the off-exchange derivatives market goes from 67 trillion to over 600 trillion in less than eight years. By the way, 600 trillion amounts to $100,000 in derivatives bets for every man, woman, and child on the planet including all the little babies, all the squealing infants, everyone in India, China, you know, everybody gets $100,000 in derivatives bets. What happened then? Exactly what a 19th century common law judge would have told you would happen. We immediately had a whole bunch of institutions that wanted to profit from betting, that made bets they couldn't afford to lose, they did lose them, and they went bust. That's what happened to Enron. They didn't go bust because of fraud. The fraud was to cover up the fact that they'd gone bust because they made bad bets on energy derivatives. That's what happened to AIG. They made a bunch of bets with Goldman Sachs. And by the way, AIG lost those bets. That's what just happened to MF Global. They made bets on sovereign credit that went bad, and they didn't have enough money to pay off their bets. Now what? If you want, I can talk about Dodd-Frank and how it kind of, sort of, maybe, might sort of address this problem of the massive and, as far as I can tell, historically unprecedented creation of a huge legalized gambling market. But what I think would make a lot more sense is to just go back to what worked so well before. So in a way, my proposal is simply that we get the feds out of the business of regulating derivatives trading even to the extent of saying that courts are not available to enforce derivatives deals unless you can prove they are truly insurance. And if you can't prove that one of the parties is truly insurance, you're on your own, which will mean you have to go back to private ordering. You have to go back to the exchanges or take your chances that if your counterparty loses, they're going to look at you, thumb their nose, and say, I'm not paying off the bet. This would be, in my view, a brilliant solution, both because it's time-tested, I've, I was saying at lunch, I've become a Burkean in my old age, right? I pay attention to history. We know this system worked because it worked for 100 years. It also is a solution that I think ought to appeal to something called the Federalist Society because it recognizes and respects the powers of the states to decide what sorts of contracts they think are socially valuable and should be enforced and what sorts of contracts are not socially valuable. By the way, murder for hire is another contract we think is not socially valuable and should not be enforced. It's against the law, but it's also not enforceable. We should leave that to the states because you know what? Historically, they did a good job. All right, I'm going to finish up. That's my specific remark, I think, that to me the great tragedy of Dodd-Frank is that no one looked and said, you know what? The law actually knew how to solve this problem, and it did a pretty good job of it for 100 years. And what? Actually, if you look at the Romans, 2,000 years. Why don't we consider going back to what worked before? But there's another broader part to the story, which is that I think when we look at the problem of government intervention in markets, we need to understand 
that it not only takes the crude form of, say, having the federal government become a shareholder in a firm, it can also take this subtle form of deciding to subsidize particular industries. In this case, the Commodities Futures Modernization Act was only one of the many ways that our federal government subsidized derivatives gambling. I'll just touch a few. They obviously subsidized it by making access to public courts available to derivatives gamblers, again, for the first time in American business history. But they also subsidized it by allowing banks that had access to the federal discount window and that were implicitly protected by the two big to fail interventions of the federal government to go into the gambling business. Because of course, you know, so essentially what happened with AIG was that it made a big bet with, among others, Goldman Sachs and it lost the bet. And when the government intervened to prop up by AIG, they were really intervening to prop up Goldman Sachs and to make sure that the taxpayers made sure that Goldman Sachs got every penny out of AIG that it was entitled to under its bet. Is that really what our taxpayer dollars should be going for? We also subsidized derivatives gambling by changing the bankruptcy laws to give derivatives counterparties first crack and priority at corporate assets. Not many people know this, but Mark Rose got a wonderful paper he just published in the Stanford Law Review where he traces the um, amendment of the bankruptcy code to give derivatives gamblers first bite ahead of employees and other creditors at the assets of firms that have gone bankrupt as a result of derivatives gambling. And finally, one could even argue that in a sense, we subsidized the gambling industry by allowing so many of the investment banks that were involved in proprietary trading in um, derivatives to become corporations that had access to limited liability. A lot of people have argued that when investment banks were organized as partnerships, meaning that their members did not have limited liability, they didn't take on these risks. If you allow them to be corporations, that means that if they go out and gamble, the shareholders keep the winnings, and if the firm goes insolvent, the shareholders' losses are limited, and most of the loss is borne by the bondholders and the other creditors. So I'll simply say that when we think about the problems of government intervention, I think it's worthwhile to step back and realize it can take many forms and some very subtle forms. And in this case, I would say that the 2008 credit crisis was in large part the result not of evolution in the marketplace or of a few bad apples or even of human greed, which I view as a, something of a universal, knowing what I do know about Roman history. It was the result of government intervention and, in essence, intervention that took the form of subsidizing gambling as a major U.S. industry. Thank you. All right. Um, lots to say and lots to respond to. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> before I get to my comments, I'm going to sort of offer a, a, a retort to, to uh, Professor Stout's view. And as I go through my thoughts, I'll sort of try to uh, 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 respond and, and, and build on some of the thoughts that Professor Zaring uh, has shared with, with everyone. But before I do all of that, I want to tell a little story about my own experience with uh, derivatives trading, so to speak. Uh, so when I was in uh, the Kennedy School of Government with a, with a bunch of government students, it's a very different ethos than business schools, um, uh, and one that I was always kind of a stranger, uh, a strange uh, uh, participant to. So we had a public interest auction, uh, and one of the items up for auction was uh, lunch with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company for 12 people. And my immediate thought was, wow, I got a bid on that, and then I can go sell it to the B-School students mm -hmm. and make money off of it. So I, I would sort of package my own derivative and, uh, and uh, sell it off and see, you know, see how well that went. Well, it, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, the CEO in question was the CEO of Fannie Mae. And uh, two weeks later, Franklin Raines uh, was charged by the SEC as well as by the DOJ with a wide variety of accounting irregularities. Um, so what does that tell you? Well, it, it tells you sometimes when you bet, you lose. Okay, I knew that. I knew that. It still hurts uh, to tell this story, by the way. Um, it also tells you that 
the, the Fannie Mae uh, and Freddie Mac fiasco has been going on for a long time because this is the first major, uh, 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 this is one of the first major accounting uh, scandals at Fannie uh, Mae and at Freddie uh, Mac. And I think the first, the first big one that hit the news was around 2003. So this has been a, a, an entity that's been, that's been slowly dying from the inside for almost uh, 10 years. It's been in existence uh, for uh, near on 40 years, uh, I believe. It's a, it's a prime example of the you know, central topic of today's discussion, government ownership in, in private or ostensibly private or quasi-private uh, corporations. And it, it's an example I want to keep coming back to as I go through my discussion. First, a couple of responses to Professor Stout's view uh, on uh, uh, trading and, and the characterization of trading as betting. Within Professor Stout's taxonomy, I have trouble differentiating between derivatives, uh, between swaps or uh, uh, you know, any financial instruments and, and just everyday stocks and bonds. I mean, I see uh, stocks and, 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 and bonds or, or uh, even convertible bonds all as bets of some kind or another, bets on liquidity risk, uh, bets on, on revenue growth. Uh, I see stocks uh, not as a hard piece of ownership of something, but I see it as essentially a bet and a hope for future dividends, uh, a hope for a future M&A deal, um, some value to the voting rights, although I would frankly see very little value to the stock voting rights, uh, but essentially a bet of one kind or another. She characterizes risk betting as a zero-sum game, but I would disagree for a couple of reasons. First because risk transfer can take advantage of the comparative ability of uh, different groups to, to uh, manage uh, risk. Uh, so some people are particularly good at managing one type of risk, others comparatively better at managing a different type of risk. As you trade that risk, uh, you obtain comparative advantage just like in international trade, the basic reason for the advantage of international trade. You obtain price discovery as well, just as you do in the equities and bond markets. Uh, derivative markets can obtain price discovery. Uh, 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 you you um, can obtain liquidity to the extent that these uh, derivatives are linked in many cases to other financial instruments. Derivatives that are linked to bonds or linked to stocks can help provide liquidity in those markets to which they are linked. Um, uh, and uh, finally, I just want to make a quick observation about the central clearing uh, regime that's created under the Dodd-Frank Act. You know, central clearing uh, uh, can potentially have some advantages if done the right way, just like I think self-regulatory organizations can have advantages if done the right way. The National Futures Association, for example, very interesting self-regulatory organization that's committed to uh, 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 maintaining integrity within the industry. But sometimes self-regulation goes awry, as in the case, I think, with FINRA. And I think uh, it's uh, accurate to say that FINRA is no longer a self-regulatory organization. It's an agent of the SEC. Uh, it's essentially an off-budget agent of the SEC uh, that's paid for by the industry. Similarly, I think what we'll see with, with uh, the type of central clearing agencies created by the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, we'll see agencies that are beholden to the regulators uh, rather than central clearing sort of uh, uh, more innova in innovations created from the bottom up, uh, we'll see sort of top-down mandates to the structure uh, of these central clearing organizations. And we've already begun to see it. Right, we already saw, I think, one of, the, one of the most intellectually lazy things we saw that the regulators decide to do with the central clearing agencies was to just graft over cookie cutter corporate governance uh, reforms that actually really didn't work in, in the publicly traded issuer markets, like independent directors uh, and like limits, uh, ownership limits uh, for the central clearing agencies that I think is going to have a real cost in the innovation of central clearing processes and competition between, between central clearing uh, 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 organizations. So with that, let me just sort of segue back into the government ownership uh, question, the costs of government ownership. Um, I define government ownership and government control very loosely. Obviously, you don't have to be a majority owner to have control of a publicly traded company or, or a uh, company under conservatorship. Illegal uh, powers can give you control. Uh, uh, the uh, government's position as a substantial creditor can give it control. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think, and I think we also see the government exercise a sort of soft power. Uh, David mentioned that uh, in many ways, in many occasions, the government doesn't vote its equity or just votes it in proportion to what other people 
are voting, I don't think it really matters. I think we're talking about the sort of soft power the, the, that we saw, you know, Marlon Brando exercise in The Godfather, where everybody else is trying to figure out what you want rather than you, than you having to tell them uh, what to do, which is the best kind of power to have. Uh, I think the fundamental issue I have with government ownership, that my, my primary concern is one of transparency. And I think that the, the, the very first step the government took in acquiring its controlling equity in banks through TARP, um, uh, which, 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 by which I mean the conversion from the preferred shares that were taken uh, during the Bush administration to the common equity to which it was converted during the Obama administration, was done solely out of, that, that conversion from, com, from, from preferred to common equity was done solely out of an interest in gaming the banking stress tests. That was it, right? The Treasury and the Fed wanted to see high uh, tier one ratios and core tier one capital ratios because that's how we gauge bank health. We do a little ratio we, we, in the numerator. We put uh, capital, a particular type of capital, whoever's very last in line, uh, in the event of bankruptcy, and we divide it by the assets the bank holds, and we say that ratio is some indicator of bank health. So preferred dividends aren't included in the numerator, preferred shares aren't included in that numerator, but common equity is, because we figure the market, uh, you know, is going to make a decision about how much common equity to buy based on the risk it perceives. So the government converted solely out of an interest in, in gaming that ratio, and I think in, in, in creating a false sense of confidence in, in the stress test that it conducted. We've seen historically examples of economies that depend on government ownership in banks. Uh, and the evidence from uh, uh, Andre Schleifer and other economists that have done sort of broad studies of this uh, just goes in one direction. I mean, it always results in lower GDP growth. It always results in a less profitable banking sector, uh, reduced access uh, to credit. So some of the sort of macroeconomic evidence seems to me to be pretty clear. Um, but I think also when you take a more of a microeconomic view, and particularly a public choice view, just to, just to give one last bit of theory, um, I, what I would describe it as, in the popular press, you'd call it sort of crony capitalism, to be a little bit more uh, sophisticated, I'd say it's, 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 it's rent transfer networks, essentially, that develop around the private company. The government's relationship with the private company allows for rent transfer, essentially off-budget uh, rent transfer, uh, to constituents of the government-controlled organization. And I think that that type of rent transfer uh, is, uh, is um, part, of the, part of the deal, I think, that we see uh, in contrast to the, to the to the, the basic explanation of the deal between the FDIC and regulated commercial banks, uh, the deal here is, is a crony deal, and it's a crooked deal. And I think it's a deal in which we see a lot of regulatory forbearance, not only from the banking regulators, but from the securities regulators as well. I mean, it took the, the SEC a long time to, to really uh, go after Fannie and Freddie. Uh, we saw a lot of negotiated settlements uh, in the initial cases they brought. Even, you know, Franklin Raines, I think, got a pretty good deal from the SEC. Finally, maybe in this most recent case, issued just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the SEC will, will uh, really take him down. But I, I think we see, we see a cronyism in which uh, the bank gets uh, some regulatory forbearance in terms of, 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 uh, of financial disclosure in exchange for its willingness to cater to the, to the interest groups networks that develop. Now, I don't have a good answer for how long it takes those interest group networks, transfer networks, to uh, uh, develop and where the, the rents that are created here uh, are transferred to the interest groups. Um, but I think it takes a while. Obviously, Fannie and Freddie, it's a 40-year company, so uh, it definitely can happen in 40 years. I know that. Uh, some of the uh, uh, banks were able to exit TARP very quickly, uh, in part because a lot of them really didn't want uh, to get TARP money in the first place, and they were forced to do so by Paulson um, uh, in order to not create a negative signal for those uh, that did accept TARP money. Uh, so I don't know that they provide a really representative sample for how long it takes for rent transfer networks to develop, uh, but I think we've definitely seen it at GM. Uh, and I think that uh, it's going to be a long time before the government sells off the remaining half of its stake in GM, in part just simply because uh, the price has to come up quite a bit for them to be able to claim uh, breaking even on that, but I also think in part it's because uh, of the uh, development of really firm uh, uh, rent transfer networks uh, at that institution. <coughs> so um, 
One thing just to note very quickly, one of the narratives that has developed about the TARP program in particular and about the bailout more generally, um, by that I mean not just TARP but also Fannie Freddie uh, and, AI, and, and the Federal Reserve's ownership of AIG, is that it was a success, right? We've heard the Obama administration made that argument quite a bit. And uh, if you're willing to buy that, I, I want to take you on a tour of the city, bring a checkbook. There's some monuments that I think you might be interested in. Um, because when you crunch the numbers, it doesn't look quite as good. First of all, the major banks, the big 17 that took TARP money, it looks pretty good there, okay? We've got 163, $163 billion that was given to those 17 banks. 90% of that's been collected. Oh, wow, okay, that's great. That's good. Although most of those gave it back very, very quickly and didn't want it in the first place. So I don't know that, uh, let's throw those out. So we're closer now to 60, 70 percent. Let's look at small banks. Small banks, there are over 400 small banks that took, community banks that took TARP money. The overwhelming majority of them have yet to pay back uh, their TARP investments. We look to the autos. Okay, we've got about a, uh, uh, an $84 billion dollar uh, investment, about $35 billion of that is repaid. Whoops. Okay, that's not a great story. It's not horrible, but it's not great. We're not sure yet how much of that we're going to get back, but most of it's still outstanding, particularly in GM and in Ally Financial. Fannie and Freddie. Well, I should go AIG next to build it. AIG. <laughs> uh, well, that hasn't lurked out so well. We've got almost $100 billion we're waiting on, depending on uh, how you count. It's interesting to see uh, AIG on their website. They list the Federal Reserve loans, and then they list the Treasury's equity uh, in terms of shares, but they don't give a dollar number. Um, uh, and then once you throw in Fannie and Freddie, uh, you're talking about, uh, depending on how you count, again, because it's both uh, money from Treasury uh, as well as support from the Federal Reserve in terms of the Fed's uh, uh, taking uh, Fannie and Freddie issued securities into its portfolio. But on, order of, on the order of 120 to 150 billion dollars, still outstanding, depending on how you count, as well as the fact that monetary policy has been cramped quite a bit, right? I mean, usually when the Fed needs to raise interest rates, as some imagine someday soon it will, it has readily marketable Treasury securities uh, uh, to use in its portfolio. But now the nature of the Federal Reserve's uh, asset portfolio has changed dramatically to something that I think is going to be much, much harder to sell when the Fed needs to start uh, uh, selling assets uh, uh, to raise interest rates. Other costs, I think that the um, moral hazard problems are ma magnified by the presence of government ownership. I think we have to account for the cost of the competitors having to compete with a government-backed company. So life's kind of tough when you're forward and you're competing with GM uh, and uh, uh, you know, you're competing with, I think, preferential treatment from the DOE uh, and the DOT uh, toward the government-owned company. Uh, I think that we, we see a, a reorientation of industrial policy as well toward green energy. And I think that uh, uh, GM's uh, uh, continued support for something that, that has not been particularly profitable uh, in terms of electric cars. Uh, you know, I, I think it, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here, but I think it's related uh, to the to the controlling government ownership of GM, and only time will tell whether that's true or not. Um, so, finally, I just I just sort of want to uh, um, describe an alternative, right? So, Hank, if Hank Paulson were here, he would say, "Well, I was facing a trillion dollar, you know." Uh, 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 disaster, what would you have done? So I just want to throw out very quickly, very simple answer, Hank. First of all, as we implement Basel III, how do, how do we not do this again? Okay. As we implement Basel III, uh, capital requirements for, for banks, no more preferential treatment to sovereign debt. No more preferential treatment to Fannie and Freddie debt. The Basel III Accords still still give preferential treatment and capital adequacy requirements to sovereign debt. Greek debt, uh, you know, some, sometimes there are charges when a, when a country is already in problematic territory, but for the most part, we're still going to give preferential treatment to sovereign debt. As we implement Basel III, I think we need to depart from the accords, despite the fact that we've uh, sort of agreed to them in principle, uh, and get rid of that altogether.
I think that we need to give instead preferential treatment to contingent debt, debt that converts to equity uh, in the event of um, uh, you know, in the event of a liquidity problem, uh, I think that uh, contingent convertible bonds, contingent convertible uh, uh, instruments generally, uh, we need to encourage and we, we, we need to treat them as core tier one capital in the banking uh, 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 as we implement Basel III. Uh, I think bankruptcy has to, has to be a big part of the discussion uh, and I think we need to walk away from the orderly liquidation authority created by Dodd-Frank toward a bankruptcy solution along the lines of the Sk David Skeel proposal. Uh, to permit three creditors to bring uh, a, uh, 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 call them even just, just SIFIs, even if you could just allow them to bring a SIFI into uh, liquidation. You know, I, I think that the Lehman uh, issue has been overblown quite a bit, and I think I agree with Skeel on this, uh, that Lehman was a fairly, fairly orderly process, uh, and that uh, uncertainty about uh, government uh, policy uh, going forward was really what caused the problem, not the actual Lehman bankruptcy itself. And then I would move toward some kind of an early warning system. Uh, I think that there's a great deal of value in credit default swap trading. Uh, I would, I would uh, in contrary to, to Professor Stout, I, I would actually uh, want to promote as much credit default swap trading as possible, and I would link federal financial regulatory policy to the credit default market so that we have some sort of an early warning system where banking regulators have to act when the price of a bank's credit default swaps uh, reach some certain trigger um, because I think that one of the problems with the regulatory forbearance that we've seen on the part of the banking regulators thus far is that boy when they take a wait and see approach they really take a wait and see approach uh, with regulated banks and with uh, troubled banks and I think from 2007 to 2009 we saw about 75 percent of uh, troubled banks went directly to insolvency that's not supposed to be the way it happens the FDIC is supposed to swoop in with examiners. They're supposed to say, all right, cut your dividends, cut some staff, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sell a lot of new stock to become healthy again. That's, that's you know, a 75% number is a failing grade for the FDIC. So I think that uh, I would link CDS prices into regulatory policy directly. So with that, I look forward to continuing the discussion with my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much. Those were three wonderful presentations. Uh, we are past the, uh, the time when we were going to originally turn it over to you. So let's have a, at least a, sh a shorter but, but, uh, but meaningful period uh, uh, in which the speakers uh, exchange remarks among themselves, perhaps responsibly. Yeah, no, I'd just like to respond briefly to what JW was, the counter arguments he was making with, I'd like to um, clarify one thing disagree with him on one thing and agree with him on one thing. The thing I want to clarify is that um, one of the problems with pointing out that derivatives are bets is that people are sometimes confused by the fact that the word bet is sometimes used sloppily in the English language. A bet is, again, an agreement between people in which they exchange one thing and one thing only. Mutual promises to pay money based on what occurs in the future. So when JW says that he bought a lunch with the CEO and was going to resell it, he didn't exactly create a derivative. He bought a lunch, and someone was actually going to eat the food. A real thing was going to be produced and consumed. Um, similarly, when he says that he bets when he buys stock and bonds, that's actually not correct either. When you buy stock, you give real money to a corporation which uses it to make real investments. So I just want to clarify that when I talk about derivatives as bets, I'm actually using bet in its classic Merriam-Webster definition form, not in the sloppy and somewhat broader form that laypersons often use the phrase. I am literally talking about agreements where the only thing that changes hands is money based on predictions for the future. Um, so that's a clarification. My disagreement is. Can, can I just ask a little? Yeah, a little yeah. Can Can you perhaps state that in other ways? Because when I'm hearing you say that, I'm thinking about in, insurance policies. I can I can make a, a bet on uh, the life of someone in my family, right. but I can't make a bet on your life. And so there's you're really what you what you're what you're saying is striking me. You're saying if there's nothing like an insurable interest, if there's not an identifiable right. related risk right. attached to the. But I guess you're saying it's I, not a bet. Can I speak to that, Don? Actually, you can make a bet on someone else's life. And in fact, 
that sort of betting is very speculative, and it's also been very useful uh, to people that are dying. They can sell off their life insurance policies and obtain money very quickly to help them with end-of-life care. Right. I they're, mean, called, it's, they're called it, biotical it's no policies, and they were not legally enforceable until the same time as we change. Now, and that, thank goodness they are. Well, well, I'm not going to go for the thank goodness, because now we're going to get to JW's. Now we're going to get to the point where but, I disagree. But, but can I just ask JW oh, okay. a little thing on that example? Yeah. But, but uh, the, the third person can't take out the policy in the first instance, right. can they? I, I, no, they, you're they, saying they can. someone can take out a policy, one can take out a policy yeah. on one's own life and then, right. then assign the proceeds. One of, one of the I'm just pointing to, the, to the, yeah. the utility there is very similar to the utility I see when one bank has a fixed interest rate and it wants to get variable uh, returns and another bank has a variable rate and it wants fixed returns because of the relative risk profiles of the rest of their portfolio and their relative comparative advantage in the management of risk. And I think that that trade, though, you know, is described right. as zero-sum Quick it's actually answer. Quick answer. It's actually um, one of the, if you read the common law cases, they're hilarious because everything we're talking about today was completely recognized by common law judges, although they didn't talk about it in economic terms. So one of the problems with derivatives or betting, in addition to the problem of eroding returns and increasing risks, is that they can create problems of moral hazard. If you can bet on a horse race, you're going to be tempted to mess around with the health of the horses. That's a right. whole other area, but, right. but that's, I'm, I'm actually talking about a problem that is in some ways older and more fundamental than the moral hazard problem. Now, going back to JW's um, point, I have no objection to derivatives betting that truly reduces risk. None at all. The common law had no objection to derivatives betting that truly reduced risk. We call that insurance. And so if you've got some banks that are really insuring against things that they have a risk in, I have no problem with that. The problem is that you can also use bets to take on risk. And all we have to do is look at what happened in 2008. Did derivatives reduce our risk? I don't think so. <laughs> it didn't seem to have turned out that way. I think it's just denying history to say that we can safely assume, and there are other reasons as well, but I think it's pretty clear to me that the OTC derivatives market by 2008 was primarily speculative gambling and not true risk hedging. We certainly know it didn't reduce risk. Now, very quickly, two other common defenses of derivatives gambling are price discovery and liquidity. Price discovery actually only works when one of the betters is, in fact, what Milton Friedman would call an information arbitrageur. They truly have superior information. Those information arbitrageurs who are doing real price discovery should make profits over time. We know, again, as an empirical fact, that in most speculative markets, the people who call themselves information arbitrageurs, in fact, lose money. So they may think that they're discovering prices, but the empirical evidence suggests, no, they're just betting on what turns out to be, on average, a mistaken prediction, because on average, they're not making money. And finally, the liquidity argument, again, um, that's a classic defense of any kind of trading, whether it's zero sum, negative sum, or positive sum. And again, I would say there's certainly room for some liquidity, but where was the liquidity in 2008? The first, I, I, I was on the board of a mutual fund in October 2008, and I can tell you our biggest concern was that when things started to go to hell in a handbasket, where was all that liquidity that those derivatives traders were supposed to give us? It well, disappeared. Part of so, it was waiting, obviously, on the prospect of government bailout and the prospect right, of uncertain government right. policy. But, but, but again, I would say, in a way, what JW and I are arguing about is an empirical question. Clearly, some kinds of uh, derivatives betting could produce these social benefits. The question is, are they large enough to justify the social costs, which we are experiencing even today? My response is, I think we probably don't need quite so much. If we could have a little less price discovery and a little less liquidity and get more economic stability, I'd make that deal. And by the way, you know who gave us reasonable amounts of liquidity and price discovery without crashing the system? My favorite privately organized exchanges. If you wanted to you know, look at where the price of wheat was going to go, you could go right to the commodities, you know, to the Chicago Board of Trade, and you didn't have to worry about crashing the system. Now, finally, what I want to agree with, though, he says that cronyism in this market is a problem. Boy, is it ever. One of the most amazing things to me is that it's not like there weren't a lot of people who didn't see this coming. I, Donald was kind enough 
to mention my 1995 article. Here's my 1998 article where I say before we pass the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, you know, this could cause some real problems in terms of increased risk and eroded returns. There were lots of people saying this. Brooks Lee Bourne was saying it at the Commodities Futures Modern, uh, the CFDC. Um, Martin Mayer was saying it in his writings. He's the author of that book, The Lawyers and the Bankers, one of our you know, best business journalists. The, uh, the, um, uh, the very first person, the Congressional Budget Office, no, the GAO. The GAO reduced an extensive, released an extensive report on this in 1995. A lot of people were saying this. None of the regulators listened, and I cannot help but consider the possibility that one of the reasons why they didn't listen was that Wall Street banks were at the time tied with trial lawyers for being the single largest contributors to campaigns on both sides of the political divide. Now, we haven't mentioned today at all the credit rating agencies, and I think we all recognize that was one of the fundamental problems that led to 2008. And why was that? Because government regulators defined the entire business model of the credit rating agency business. And I think we're moving toward exactly that with central clearing. We're going to define what a central, what a central exchange should look like, who should own it, what sorts of uh, 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 contracts can be traded on it. We're repeating the very same problem that led us back to 08 with the central clearing regime that Dodd-Frank creates. Prepare yourselves, folks. I'm going to agree with JW again. And it really is distressing to me to see the way Title VII, although it tries to move derivatives back onto the clearing, onto the clearing houses and the exchanges, repeats exactly the, those mistakes by saying, and we're going to let the government decide what these clearing houses look like, who gets to be a clearing house, which of them are systemically important. The reason why the darn thing work the reason why the darn, thing work, darn things worked in the 19th century, as far as I can tell, is that the government had nothing to do with it. So, well, I wouldn't this abolish is first. Do you property want me, do, rights yeah, Do you want me to defend however. credit rating agencies? I'll just, I'll just do it briefly. Okay, okay. so. Uh, um, Good. Uh, so the government um, sanctioning a credit rating agency, for starters, uh, it's interesting, uh, and uh, oddly enough, um, in, through the Basel process, the, the Europeans are doubling down, and, and we will too, presumably, yeah. on the importance of credit ratings. Yeah. So if you thought that credit rating agencies go long, you should worry. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm actually a little less sure that credit rating agencies do a bad job. Um, I think there's a market for their services, and I think that um, uh, the fact that, you know, um, we've got, I mean, you know, I, I compare them to the accounting uh, shops, which are also subject to government oversight and nonetheless um, are trusted by investors to provide information. And I think the problem with the, fi the, the credit rating agencies had with the financial crisis is that they were rating these complicated derivatives that they weren't used to rating. And I think they were doing that not because the SEC encouraged them to do so, but because uh, they thought there was a, a, a market for that. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything, the problem there was that uh, there was a lack of oversight um, uh, that led these credit rating agencies to, to try to take on a job it couldn't uh, do. But let me, let me So, so I, I like overseeing credit rating agencies. <laughs> I like yeah. them. I think if we're going to have them, oversight may not be a bad idea. But I just want to point out uh, that, in fact, the SEC did subsidize credit rating agencies to the following extent. And again, this is something I'm very keenly uh, uh, sensitive to as a mutual fund trustee. Mutual funds are not allowed to buy certain securities for their portfolios unless they have certain credit ratings. And when the Securities Exchange Commission imposed that requirement on mutual funds, which, by the way, may not be a bad, I mean, there's, there's good policy reasons for it, but one of the things it did do was it essentially was a government subsidy to the credit raging agencies because it, it created a captive audience to purchase their services. Sure. Well, I, I wonder if one way to close out the panel uh, and, and turn it over to questions from the floor might be, uh, and we've gotten into it already to some extent, but can each of you perhaps offer up a few steps, next step you, you'd like to see the United States take or the United States take in concert with other, uh, with other countries to uh, address the problems we've been talking about? Uh, well, since I went last, I guess I'll go first. I'll say, first of all, a general philosophical thing to keep in mind. Um, that I want to leave everyone with after this, today's discussion is that uh, one man's speculation, just as one man's trash is another man's treasure, one man's speculation is another man's price discovery. And I think that the fatal conceit of the Dodd-Frank Act is that it assumes it knows the difference between speculation and price discovery. 
uh, and, and the, the fatal conceit, I think, often behind the CFTC in general is that it knows the difference between speculation and price discovery. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that once, once you look at a market and you say that market is illegitimate, not for some you know, immoral reason like, like, like murder or like prostitution. It's a different, just, uh, it, it's something that, you know, when you look at a market like, like you say, sports stars should never make that much or, you know, this, this person or that person in the market should never earn that much for what they do. This type of financial instrument should never be traded. Once you do that, you've rejected uh, the, the central uh, premise of the, of the Hayekian model that served us so well. But do you think, markets are better processors you, of information you, than central parties. And you, you, and you accept that a central party like, like the SEC, like the credit rating agency's uh, oligopoly that was created by the SEC, is better equipped to deal with this than private markets are. Would and you leave it to the premise. states then? Would you be comfortable yeah. having the states return to anti-bucket shop laws? And uh, no, I, I, I also believe that you have to respect the property rights of the people that create these financial instruments as well. And you yep. don't want the state to create and define property rights. You want the federal government to. As a Hayekian uh, conservative, I believe that the state is there to support property rights and basic safety. And, and, I and the would federal government. The By the way, those two are inconsistent with each other. No. Nah. <laughs> Disagree. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I would simply say free market is actually an oxymoron. A free market is a place where somebody who's bigger than stronger than me gets to bop me over the head and take my purse. Hobbes is a free market. The reality is that in any successful economy, you need to have a government that sets the rules of the road and enforces them. And that I would, I, you know, sort of a pragmatic on this. I am, by the way, I view myself not as a Hayekian per se, but I view myself as a capitalist to the bone. I love capitalism. I think it's the source of peace and prosperity, but it cannot exist without some basic rules of the road. One of the rules of the road is that we only give government subsidies to financial arrangements that we think contribute to social welfare. If your trade doesn't provide an overall increase in social welfare, why on earth should we devote social resources to supporting it? And the fact is contracts for murder for hire generally fail that test. Contracts for the sale of fraudulent or tainted goods generally fail that test. And wagering contracts, it's been decided for 2,000 years, generally fail that test which doesn't necessarily, I mean, we actually make murder for hire in the sale of tainted goods. They're normally crimes. But I don't see why we can't be a little more subtle and say we'll have an area in between legally enforceable contracts and crimes where we say, look, you guys can go off and gamble as, one, as much as you want, but don't expect us to make our court system available to you. Don't expect us to make the Fed's discount window <laughs> available to you. Don't expect us to make taxpayer funds to bail you out available to you. Don't expect to be first in line in bankruptcy. And maybe even don't expect to be able to take advantage of the limited liability that goes along with the corporate form. But uh, do you have any uh, uh, response to uh, JW's point that, uh, that uh, uh, that, that in some cases a, a naked bet can be made in the context of a broader portfolio? Do, do you have any kind of nexus yeah. well, uh, requirement was, that allows the bet to go forward? Right. What I will say is that actually none of these are new issues. Courts were sorting out the difference between purely speculative gambling contracts and contracts that actually performed an insurance co function. Mm -hmm. They were doing it in the United States for 130 years. Actually, they've been doing it for more like 150 years because they do it in the insurance context. So I don't think, again, that that's something I would necessarily want to have a federal bureaucrat doing. And I'm not saying you can do it perfectly, but you can do it well enough, in part because when people in the marketplace know that courts will not enforce pure gambles, they actually have an incentive to exchange information with each other to make sure that at least one of the parties does have a real economic interest at risk that would be legally recognized. So again, the joy of this old common law state-based system was that it got government out of it and put the burden on the private parties to make sure that their deal truly was mutually beneficial. And if they thought that it wasn't, then they would either not trade or they would say, well, you know, we each still hope to profit. We'll go to one of these private gambling clubs we call commodity exchanges, and they will make sure that neither of us gets in and over our heads to the point where we take down large, systemically important institutions. 
Thank you. Can I ask a question? That's true. Um, you described a state-based system. Would you allow some states to have one regime and some states another and have them compete with each other and see which one works better? Absolutely. Okay. In a heartbeat. And that's exactly what the law did. Now, what is interesting is that they virtually all came up with some version of the so-called rule against difference contracts. And we can talk about arbitrage. The other thing was, because these contracts were contrary to public policy, it wasn't like you could open up a derivatives markets in, in Vermont and people from New and Vermont could lure people from New York to go there and gamble, because then the contracts were no longer enforceable in New York. So you would have had to post assets in Vermont before the counterparty would trade with you. This, by the way, solves the London problem. Every time we talk about regulating derivatives, someone says, oh, well, we can't do that because all of the derivatives trading will go to London. And I say, not if we pay attention to the old common law choice of contract rules. They're not going to London um, because the Londoners won't trade with them unless they post assets in London because the contracts would not be enforceable against U.S. assets. Thanks. Uh, uh, David, our uh, audience is getting itchy to ask questions, but yeah, yeah, you, you yeah, gave yeah. A, a great uh, uh, summary before of some of the things we've done. Uh, do you have any uh, any proscriptions for what, yeah, what I mean, I most needs to be done now? I'm not a Hayekian. I'm, I'm more a Dilbertian uh, <laughs> in that I think that people who are skeptical of public uh, organizations should uh, spend time in private organizations. Mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I think many of the people here are employed by public organizations and uh, um, uh, and uh, I can tell you that private organizations have many of the same problems, even even cap ferociously capitalist ones like the Wharton School. Uh, two prescriptions, so as you can see, I'm sympathetic to regulation. And so the two prescriptions I think make the most sense going forward is uh, regulation to shrink the size of banks, and probably some of my colleagues in Wharton say uh, capital adequacy ratio mm -hmm. should not be 5%, certainly not 3%, mm -hmm. uh, not 10%, but, but 20%. Um, uh, actually, they agree with, with Jay that, um, uh, that uh, you shouldn't care what kind of debt uh, or, or uh, how you back those. So against uh, crazy corporate junk bonds or sovereign debt, um, uh, my finance colleagues don't appear to be too worried about those distinctions and don't think regulators should bother making them. Um, I think that's interesting, yeah. uh, but we should probably hear from. All right. Well, thanks. If the uh, questioners would uh, come up to the microphone, and if you would, please identify yourself by your name, and uh, and if you're comfortable doing so, your institutional affiliation. Sure. My name's Paul Salamanca. I'm from the University of Kentucky. Uh, I have, I guess, a, a hypothetical. I'll try to state it as quickly as I can. Uh, let's suppose that I'm not an airline, uh, but I can, but I think that the price of petroleum is going to go up. Um, uh, over the next six months or a year. I'm not an airline, though, but I have some money, or I at least I have access to money that I can borrow. And I buy futures in petroleum because I have a feeling that that's going to happen. And I think when people see me buying futures in petroleum and bidding the, the amount up, uh, other people are going to take note of that, particularly airlines, and that's probably going to cause people who, who extract petroleum from the earth to extract more petroleum because they can see the signal that I'm providing, even though I don't have any skin in the game. It's, that strikes me, and I, I'd like to hear your responses on that, but that strikes me as, a, as a, a substantive justification for the bet that I'm making. Uh, secondly, why is money not a commodity like petroleum? What if I have a feeling that capital is going to be short in six months? And therefore, I'm buying a future on access to capital and locking in an interest rate now. In other words, what difference does it make whether I have skin in the game in some classic Roman sense, as opposed to having a, a feeling that some commodity is going to become scarce, even if that commodity is simply money? If you were someone who really had superior information, then that would be a classic price discovery situation. If you'd actually gone out and you know, you were a geologist and you'd gotten some new information, yeah, your trade would move prices in a more accurate direction and you would make money off of it. The problem is for every person who is the geologist you, it looks like in a lot of these markets there are nine people who are the I have a feeling you. And when we look at speculative markets as an empirical matter, what we see is that people who go into them expecting to trade and make money, on average, don't. That tells us that, number one, they don't have superior information, and number two, their trading is not improving prices.
How can you improve prices if you're trade? I mean, you may move it up, you may move it down, but in a market dominated by speculators who don't seem to have, in fact, what is truly superior information, why should we think they contribute to price discovery? And in fact, I could get really technical, but there's actually a whole other body of theory that suggests why when you let in all these people who trade on feelings, as opposed to hard, reliable information that's proven to be correct, you actually get more price instability and price distortions. So if you are Milton Friedman's information arbitrager, then yes, you're providing price discovery, and by the way, we know it because you're always making money. The problem is in a lot of these markets, the data says that's not what's really going on. It's, it's, I think it's also a problem if uh, uh, you need a bailout. Uh, it's okay to gamble, but if you gamble, and, you, and let's not forget that, that bankruptcy is a yeah. bailout, right? It's yeah. a cancellation of your debts, so. I, just, I would just offer very simply, if you're a government regulator and you think that you can systematically differentiate the regulation of financial markets between speculative traders and information traders, you're probably wrong. Probably wrong. And I think that in general, I think in the long term, speculation becomes price discovery because you know, the, the information traders tend to do better than the non-information traders, and so the budget constraints change along the lines of efficiency. I think that's a, one ah. of the long-term implications of Hayekian market efficiency. Okay, this is, this, just quickly, I call this Darwin meets Barnum. Another classic argument is that, of course, in these markets, there are people who are trading on feelings, but they get weeded out. And Barnum's answer is, that's okay. There's one born every minute. The reality is, if you look at studies of the futures markets, traders who who describe themselves as speculators have lost money for 40 years. And that's because as soon as one generation figures out they're not making money, there's a new generation of doctors and dentists coming along that's willing to take a try. <laughs> Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Jeff Cove from the University of Michigan Law School. And I'd like to ask Professor Stout, if you think hedging is okay, how would you differentiate those uses of derivatives from other uses that you would consider gambling in terms of regulation? Because it seems like you have a difficult line drawing exercise yeah. and yeah. one that Dodd-Frank or um, mm -hmm. the CFTC hasn't really been able to yeah. fix. So either you allow it or you don't. Yeah. No, this is actually a variant on, on JW's question. I'd say, no, you don't. You actually do make that distinction. The Commodities Futures Trading Co Commission has been making that distinction since 1923. Common law courts have been making that distinction since at least the 1860s. So again, it's one of those things. It's like, how can you decide if someone's negligent? Well, you can't perfectly, right? There are always going to be some cases where people are found negligent who probably won't, were not, and there are people who escape being found negligent who probably were. But, you know, we should not, the perfect should not be the enemy of the good here. We have long history of both government regulators and common law courts essentially requiring parties to provide some evidence that they had a prior economic risk that they were truly hedging against. Yeah. Thanks. Great question, though. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rosanna Tremoglie. I'm judge in Italy, and I'm starting a Federalist uh, Society chapter in Italy. Oh, and uh, one of the reasons uh, that I'm starting this chapter is that the Italians think of the government as a father provider. Mm -hmm. I'm here to find inspiration. Do you have an idea? Would you give me any su nice suggestion uh, in order to help me to start changing this mentality? Thank you. I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know how to change that mentality because it's deeply ingrained, but I know that, 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 that it, uh, I have a lot of respect for, for, for the new prime minister that you have in place, for the about face that you've done uh, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I, my fear is for the United States and for the future of the United States financial markets and that the fact that, uh, you know, We've, we've taken a road in many ways very similar to Italy from, from 1990 to 2000. Uh, uh, nationalization uh, of, you know, partial nationalization post bailout. Uh, uh, and and um, to tell you the truth, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Hope for the best. Hope, hope for information traders, uh, frankly, to, 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 to help Europe going forward. I mean, one of, you know, the same sentiment, I think, that has 
uh, urged regulation of, of the derivatives industry has also been used uh, by governments and has been used uh, by uh, 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 companies at various points uh, over the last couple of years. We've seen quite a bit of, uh, of uh, skepticism of hedge fund traders in, in, in government bonds and trying to blame you know, information trading in government bonds. And as we saw Greece do that, we saw you know, Italy do that. And uh, we've similarly, uh, in 2008, we saw um, the Fortune 500 companies blame short sellers. And they said, well, short sellers are the cause of this crisis. Uh, we need to regulate short sellers. Uh, but you know, I fundamentally think that any company not able to survive a bear raid doesn't deserve to survive. It needs to be chopped up and split up. And I think that you've got to change the culture and the mentality toward being comfortable with, with creative destruction. That's really what it's all about. In the long term, that mentality will serve you much better uh, than, than protectionism of particular institutions. Well, thank you. We have one, uh, one last question, I gather. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to uh, pick up on the, just a little bit more on the discussion, particularly between Professor Stout and Barrett. Um, the, is there, in terms of the gambling analogy? It's not an analogy. Fair it's okay. not. No, it literally I, I, no, I, is. I <laughs> it literally but is I, gambling. What, what, what I guess my question would be is, how simple do you think it is to draw the line you're drawing? Because if that line is tricky at all, then you run into the same problem you run into a lot of other things. Whoever sets the lines has a, has enormous power and enormous ability to cause trouble. And mm -hmm. My guess, but I'm willing to be talked out of this, is that line isn't, that when you first talked about it, it sounded really clear, but I suspect that the more I think about it, I'm not so sure it is. So, and I think you were discussing this a little bit, so maybe I can encourage yeah, you to discuss it. But Gene, I think one of the, one of the primary differences between you. gambling that we think of as gambling societally and, and the type of, I'm willing to call it gambling, Professor Stout wants to, gambling in the financial markets, mm -hmm. is that uh, the systematic returns are designed to be negative in a casino and they're designed to be positive outside of the casino. Now, you'll tell me, oh, well, the derivative markets, that's negative. What do you look at 2008? I think if we were having this discussion, say, about equity markets in 1988, 1989, or in 1933 yeah. or 1934, we would say, oh, you're telling me that equities are not a negative proposition always and everywhere, but then you look over 100 years and you see a very different situation. Yeah. So it's the difference between talking to my grandmother of the Great Depression era about equity markets and talking about, you know, somebody that's um, mm -hmm. lived a lot longer, and, uh, maybe not yeah. lived a lot longer, but, but uh, grew up in a different era, completely different era. And I think that part of, is part of the tenor of this discussion about derivatives and, and the next generation of financial yeah. instruments. And so I, you know, I think that systematically it's just, it's just a system designed to, be ne to, to, to generate negative returns versus one de designed yeah. to generate positive returns through the diversification of risk opportunities yeah. that it provides. Now, that, that's a, uh, uh, okay, I got to disagree again. Totally false analogy. The fact is when people buy stocks, they can and historically have earned positive returns over time because real money is going to real corporations that are investing it in real projects that generate real profits. It is impossible to generate positive returns from derivatives trading, just like it's impossible to generate positive returns from online poker. The only money that comes out of the poker game is the money that the players brought to the poker game. I mean, that's honestly, JW, that defies math. It can't be done. Now, you can. Well, that's because you're not telling the finish. right thing. When you, use it, when you use it for true risk hedging, you can reduce risks, but you will never, ever, ever be able to generate a positive return from gambling. It's simply mathematically impossible. And now going back again to the question of how do we tell the difference? All I can say right, is right. I actually think it's way easier than people acknowledge, in part because a rule of unenforceability creates incentives for the two counterparties to figure it out. And if they can't figure out if one of them is, you know, surely they know whether one of them is truly risk hedging. And if one of them is truly risk hedging and you could prove that to a court, then they'll be confident their deal will be enforced. And if after talking to each other they conclude they can't make that case, my view is that's probably not a contract that should be enforced. Well, speaking of telling a difference, I can <laughs> tell the difference on the schedule between this session and the reception yeah. <laughs> that starts just about now in the diplomat ballroom. So let me close by thanking uh, our three panelists.
not just for their time today, but for the years of wonderful scholarship and hard work yep. that brought you to the point of being on the panel today. And thank you all for attending so much. And I hope to see you at the reception.